Welcome back. What I want to do in this video is I want to explore a little bit about the enzymes that break down glycogen. Okay. So in previous videos we've looked at the biosynthesis of glycogen, but now let's say we've you know we've 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 stored up glycogen and we're going to go out for a run and initially the the pathways that are going to be active are going to be the glycolytic pathways. So we're going to have to fuel glycogen or excuse me glucose catabolism somehow so we're going to have to free each of the glucose monomers from the glycogen polymer and so what i've drawn here is i've drawn a, i've drawn a glycogen polymer at least part of one right so up here this is like this up here is where you know a branch is here's the rest of this particular uh carbohydrate chain and specifically this part right here this part over here on the left side is the non is the non reducing end and specifically the the monomer that's going to come off initially is going to be part of the non reducing end okay so whenever glycogen gets catabolized you catabolize from the non reducing end okay but before we really get into the enzymatic activity of the enzyme that breaks down glycogen I'll also let me go ahead and name the enzyme so the enzyme that breaks down glycogen is going to be is what the enzyme is well it's called glycogen phosphorylase glycogen phosphorylase and glycogen phosphorylase is an enzyme that has to be activated first so we'll look at how it has to be activated first okay so essentially what we have is we have a cell All right we have a cell here's the cell membrane cell membrane right and in the membrane, we have something called a beta adrenergic receptor. A beta adrenergic receptor. And specifically, there's going to be a molecule that binds to it. And specifically, that molecule is called epinephrine. So let me go ahead and draw epinephrine. So epinephrine has its characteristic catechol ring, right? Characteristic catechol ring, methyl group, two protons, positive charge. Anyways. So epinephrine is going to bind ultimately to the beta adrenergic receptor. And what you have to understand, and we, we have a, we'll have a playlist on biosignaling and all that, but what you have to understand is that the beta adrenergic receptor is associated with a G protein. So here's a G protein, right? And it's specifically divided into three parts, right? There is, and actually let me do this in yellow, there is a beta subunit, there is a gamma subunit, and then there's also, there's also an alpha subunit. And specifically, it's the alpha subunit that picks up a GTP, and it dissociates from the rest of the G protein whenever epinephrine binds. And so over here, we have an enzyme. And this enzyme, we'll do it in purple, this enzyme is called adenyl cyclase. And when, and when I'll do this, try to mimic the structure a little bit, when the alpha subunit associates with the denylyl cyclase, this enzyme becomes activated, and it converts ATP into cyclic AMP. Okay? So eventually what you're going to have is you're going to have a lot of cyclic AMP that accumulates, and the cyclic AMP that accumulates activates protein kinase A. So lots of cyclic AMP activate protein kinase A. And then the protein kinase A goes and activates another enzyme. And this enzyme is called phosphorylase, phosphorylase B kinase. So what this particular enzyme is going to do is it's going to phosphorylate glycogen phosphorylase A. Okay, so then this enzyme is going to activate glycogen glycogen phosphorylase A. And so that glycogen phosphorylase A is the glycogen phosphorylase that I wrote over here. So what did we just see? Well, glycogen phosphorylase is ultimately stimulated by epinephrine. So epinephrine binds to the beta adrenergic receptor. The alpha subunit, and of course, let me write this, this is the alpha subunit of the G protein dissociates, moves along the membrane and activates, this is adenylate adenylate cyclase, and we end up with a high concentration of cyclic AMP. That activates protein kinase A, 
which activates phosphorylase B kinase, which activates glycogen phosphorylase A. So now what we need to do is we need to look at the reaction and what happens. So what's going to happen is you it's going to essentially, you're going to have a phosphate. Let me do it in purple. We have a phosphate, right? And recall that the phosphate has a lone pair on it, right? And that lone pair is essentially going to do an, a nucleophilic attack right here, and it's going to kick off the rest of the glycogen chain, right? So over here, all right, that comes off of this is the glycogen, the glycogen chain, right? And so then what you end up as the, the primary uh, product that we're looking at is glucose 1-phosphate. So here is, I'm drawing glucose 1-phosphate. How about hydroxyl group going down? And here's my phosphate right here. So glucose 1-phosphate. All right. And actually, I'll go ahead and draw this one in purple too. So glucose 1-phosphate. Right. Well, glucose 1-phosphate, you know, it it looks like something that we've seen before, but it, it, it's not exactly. It has the phosphate at the wrong position. So it turns out that there's an enzyme that can interconvert. It can interconvert between glucose 1-phosphate and glucose 6-phosphate. And that enzyme is called phosphoglucomutase. It's called phosphoglucomutase. And recall that mutases were essentially just constitutional isomerases, right? So if I was to draw glucose 6-phosphate, let me actually do that right now. Let me draw glucose. So here's, I'll just put the phosphate like that for time's sake. This hydroxyl group's going up. This is going down, and this one's going down. So this is glucose 6-phosphate, right? So what the, the mutase does is essentially forms a constitutional isomer of glucose 1-phosphate. And actually, this is a, a reversible reaction. Um, if we were going towards glycogen synthesis, we would be running it backwards towards glucose 1-phosphate, right? But in the direction of catabolism, or as, and actually let me write this, this whole process that we're doing is, has a special name. It's called glycogenolysis, or sometimes they'll pronounce it glycogenolysis. But essentially it's the process of lysing glycogen into this guy right here, glucose 1-phosphate. And that's the immediate product. But glucose 1-phosphate is sort of useless in glycolysis, so we have to convert it or mutate it into glucose 6-phosphate. And then, of course, glucose 6-phosphate... Recall that glucose 6-phosphate is in equilibrium with fructose 6-phosphate, right? And, of course, the enzyme that catalyzes that reaction is phosphoglucoisomerase. Phosphoglucoisomerase, and then glycolysis is the same from there. So, so for instance, that adrenaline rush you get, and actually, by the way, I also mentioned adrenaline is epinephrine. The, adrenaline is sort of the common name for epinephrine. But when you get that adrenaline rush, you, you feel a lot of energy initially. And what that energy is, is apparently coming from is it's coming from glycogenolysis. So through this whole biosignaling pathway that we just looked at, we'll look at it in more detail in other videos, but epinephrine binds and ultimately through a cascade activates glycogen phosphorylase A. And you initially produce glucose 1-phosphate, right? And then through phosphoglucomutase, you convert it into what? You convert it into a usable product into, that can go into glycolysis, glucose 6-phosphate. So I hope this help, video helped you get a, an understanding of what glycogen catabolism is called, and I'll mention it one more time, that the, the whole pathway is called glycogenolysis, and it tends to be stimulated by epinephrine. See you soon.